Hi, everyone. Welcome to MCLA. Thank you very much for joining us this evening for the first of our two presentations about the critical choices that face us with regards to how we manage our forests in the face of climate change. I hope you will also join us for the second presentation, which will take place on February 26th, at the same time and place here in Murdoch, 218 at 7 p.m. Before I introduce the speakers for these two presentations, I want to also invite you to join us on Thursday evenings beginning this week and continuing through April 16th to hear from experts on environmental pollution. Uh, this Thursday, Chris Reddy from the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute will give a lecture titled Plastics in the Environment, Separating Myth from Reality. Uh, and there is a sign-up sheet in the back um, where you can uh, give me your email and I will send you information about upcoming events. So for our second presentation on forests and climate, our speaker on February 26th will be Frank Lowenstein, who is also joining us tonight. Thanks for being here. Um, he currently serves as Chief Conservation Officer of the New England Forestry Foundation. He holds an MS in Botany from the University of Vermont's Field Naturalist Program and a BA in Geology from Harvard University. Prior to his work with the New England Forestry Foundation, he served as Global Director of Forest Health and as Global Climate Adaptation Strategy Leader for the Nature Conservancy. In that role, he participated in the global climate negotiations under the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, attending the negotiation sessions in Mexico and South Africa in 2010 and 2011. His practical conservation experience includes leading community-based conservation for the Nature Conservancy in the Berkshires. He's taught courses on conservation and climate change uh, at Brandeis and for uh, the Masters of Sustainability program at Harvard. Uh, he has served as a Switzer Fellow and a Senior Fellow in the U.S. Department of State's Energy and Climate Partnership for the Americas um, and on board an Executive Committee of the UN-affiliated Global Invasive Species Program. Tonight... I'm honored to introduce Dr. William Muma, uh, Emeritus Professor of International Environmental Policy and Founding Director of the Center for International Environment and Resource Policy at the Fletcher School. He currently serves as co-director of the Global Development and Environment Institute at Tufts, which he co-founded. He received his BA degree in chemistry from Williams College and PhD in physical chemistry from MIT. He had a 26-year career in chemistry and environmental studies at Williams College, where he directed the Center for Environmental Studies. He served as a AAAS Science Fellow in the U.S. Senate, where he worked on legislation that su successfully addressed ozone depletion and on legislation responding to the 1973 energy crisis. He began working on climate change in 1988 as the first director of the climate program at the World Resources Institute in Washington. He's been a lead author of five intergovernmental panel on climate change reports. The IPCC, as you remember, shared the Nobel Prize for its climate work in 2007. I'm really honored to uh, introduce you and thank you for being here tonight. Thank you. Thank you all for coming out on an evening like this. It's uh, not as uh, sleety as we've had, but it's still not, uh, we're, we're not in, in even pleasant snowy territory here. I want to talk to you about uh, climate change in forests, and uh, this has really gotten big on the agenda very recently. So I've titled it Battling Climate Change One Forest at a Time. And uh, I, in December, I was in Madrid for the climate uh, negotiations, and uh, this was just one of the Many, many posters that was there. Tick tock, tick tock, the clock is ticking. Don't call it change, call it climate emergency. Well, we had already done that. Um, uh, Bill Ripple at uh, Oregon State University, actually in the School of Forestry, had, uh, uh, was putting together a paper uh, of uh, world scientists uh, uh, warning of a climate emergency. And uh, he and I were talking about this, and I made some suggestions, and the next thing I know, I was writing more of it, and it was part of, part of, the, uh, of, of, of the group. Um, his brilliance was in getting um, 11,000 scientists from 153 countries to sign it by the time we published it on November 5th. Since then, there are more, so we're up to 13,500 from 156 countries. I haven't checked to see who the new three countries are, but that's a lot of countries. Uh, involved. And um, 
As you can see, the, just the first opening paragraph, scientists have a moral obligation to clearly warn humanity of any catastrophic threat and to tell it like it is. On the basis of this obligation and the graphical indicators presented below, we declare with more than 11,000 scientists, signatories from around the world, clearly and unequivocally that planet Earth is facing a climate emergency. And you may ask, why did 11,000 scientists agree it's an emergency? And um, we deliberately chose the term emergency rather than catastrophe or disaster or existential threat or any of those terms. Those are kind of dead-end terms. It's a disaster. Okay, it's over. We're done. Sunk. Emergency means so that uh, uh, something of high risk is happening or about to happen, and we should do something and can do something about it. So that was kind of the, the, uh, the background of that. So um, what we did was we identified 15 human activities that contribute to climate change, and then 14 trends that are climate-related. And then we listed six various area, areas of, uh, where we have to take action. And I won't go through all these. It's too small to see. But these are all contributing factors. Um, uh, you know, the, uh, the increase in fossil fuel use and all of these kinds of things that are all on there. And our plan is to update this every single year and to add new ones as they come, as, as we think of them or put them, come along. And, uh, uh, it is, uh, it, uh, the bottom right when that funny S shaped thing, that's subsidies for fossil fuels. They were going up around 2010, they started coming down, and now they've started back up again. Not, not a good sign. So there's just all kinds of information here that's really, readily accessible, and if you want to look online, just put in bioscience 11,000 scientists, and it just pops right up on Google. Um, and then these are just showing all the trends, and at the top, it's really, you know, the gases that are trapping heat, at the, and, and then the temperature rise, and then we have uh, the next four are all about melting ice around the world. I hadn't realized until we put this together that Greenland has, has actually melted twice as much as Antarctica in terms of what it's put into the ocean, almost perfectly. It's just amazing. Um, and, um, and, and sea level is rising, and uh, acidity is growing, and um, weather-related damages have, or uh, disasters have occurred, and the cost of those has gone up. That's all that information is there, and we now actually have very good um, uh, connectivity of that to a change in climate. So here are the six areas. Energy, obviously, you know, let's get off of fossil fuels and we can do all that with solar and wind and all the renewables that are out there. Um, there are other gases besides things related to energy. I mean, there's, there's, there's methane that comes from leaking natural gas, for example. Uh, in the Boston area, the leakage is, is, is so bad uh, that uh, uh, cities in the brown Boston are now banning more natural gas hookups at houses because, and then there was that huge explosion in Lawrence, remember, a year and a half ago. Uh, it is uh, it is out of control, um, and there are other other and, and the agriculture is a big source of that. I'm going to talk about natural nature-based solutions and that'll focus on forests, um, and then there's food we eat and our diet and uh, the increase in the amount of. Um, of beef and other meats and so forth, uh, as different countries like China get richer, uh, and uh, and and our diet actually, Americans have reduced their beef consumption by a, a rather significant amount in recent years, um, and that all helps because the methane that comes from from belching cattle and sheep and goats and camels and everything is is really a major contributor. About a quarter of global warming gases are coming from the agricultural sector. And not all of that is our food. Remember, 40% of our corn crop is to feed our cars, to have, gas, have, have bioethanol for our cars, which we don't need, by the way. Um, and then uh, the economy. We have an economy that does not distinguish between uh, really uh, uh, carbon dioxide emitting uh, ga gas, gas industries, industries that do that, and those that don't, and we need to find some way to get to a carbon-free economy. And then another issue is there are a lot of us on the planet. I mean, we're approaching 8 billion people, and we'll be at 9 or 10 billion people uh, in a couple of decades. And that's just not sustainable. But, but to address that, it has to be done in a way that does not disrupt society and is... Um, 
as, as, as country, particularly in, in most countries that uh, where where girls are educated and um, are voluntarily allowed to choose their own fertility management, the birth rate goes down, and uh, and, uh, and 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 it's really important to do this in in a sensitive and appropriate way. So why is climate change an emergency? It's an emergency because <laughs> I, I was involved in the first two reports there, the 2001 and 2007, and what this graphic is showing is when, how close are we, at, at what temperature increase will we start to see uh, irreversible changes that we can't do anything about. Irreversible probably means anything that we can't reverse in 100 or 1,000 years, something like that, okay? And maybe even then. So in the first report, it was between five and a half and six degrees. That's nine to 11 degrees Fahrenheit. Everything's in centigrade in the discussions of climate change. So I'll just translate it to Fahrenheit if that's okay. So between nine and 11, that's what five to six is. In the 2007 report, we realized, well, it was maybe between four and five, right? So it's, it's, uh, it's between seven and nine. By the 2013 report that came out, it's now between three and four. And in the 2018 report that just came out at the end of last, uh, of 2018, it's between one and two. I mean, that's not because we got it wrong earlier. There just wasn't enough information. There just, you know, nobody had studied enough things to put it all together. So this is not good news. And then there are changes that are, that are happening right now, some of which are irreversible. And not all, the, not all of them are on this, this graph, even though this appeared last year. Uh, the Amazon rainforest, the Arctic sea, sea ice, the Atlantic circulation. Believe it or not, the Gulf Stream is slowing down because the oceans are getting warmer, and the flow of that depends upon the difference in ocean temperature between the equator, between the Gulf of Mexico and and the Arctic Ocean just off Greenland. That difference is getting less because the Arctic is warming twice as fast as the rest of the world. Um, all of these things are happening. The boreal forest, fires and pests, coral reefs are dying, Greenland ice sheets melting, uh, Antarctic ice sheet is melting, permafrost is thawing, and the thing that's on, not on here is uh, the fires in Australia. You know, the emissions from Australia this past year are twice what the societal emissions are, what the fossil fuel and other emissions are from the fires. Um, so... Um, so, so are we running out of time? That's the question. Well, um, the second most cited paper in uh, last year on climate change was this one. And, it, and if you look at this, uh, you can see the black line are, are historic emissions of, of carbon dioxide. Of, um, uh, and, and those are starting to level off a bit. But if we keep going with current policies, it's the dark red, it's somewhere in the dark red um, wedge up there. That's where we'll be. We'll be going up. Even with the pledges that were made in Paris in 2015, we're still going up. If we want to stay below two degrees, which is one of the things that all governments agreed we should do, it's in somewhere, and there's a lot of uncertainty on this, as you can see from the width of that wedge, but in that wedge that's heading down. And if we want to stay within one and a half degrees, which is 2.7 degrees Fahrenheit rise, by the way, we're already up one degree Fahrenheit or, or uh, 1.8 degrees, um, we have to be in that light pink wedge going down. And so that's, that's the challenge. Now, this is really, really surprising and shocking to most people. Half of all the emissions of carbon dioxide uh, between, uh, by, by 2014, this is, I, this, this is the only good graphic I could get. Obviously, we're past 2014, but uh, that half of all of them ever emitted since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution in 1750 have occurred since 1988. By today, it's probably since 1992, right? Half of all of them ever emitted since 1992. There are a lot of people in this room who are, who, who are around in 1992. I can look around and tell. I, I, know, who, I know who you are. <laughs> uh, so we've been accelerating these emissions and making the problem worse. One of the issues that always comes up is who is responsible and who should take the greatest do, do things. And we all know that China now is the leading producer. But if you look at this, per capita, China with seven tons per person is less than half of the United States with 17 tons per person. Um, the accumulative emissions, the United States, it's, it's, it's good to still be number one in something. Unfortunately, this is not what I'd like to be number one in. 
uh, with a quarter of all the emissions that have ever been emitted are by the United States. And almost up with us are the 28 European EU countries. I don't, I don't know how to count that now with, with Brexit, but let's, let's say it includes Brexit. Uh, and Brexit it includes Brit Britain. Uh, and then China is half of us, 13% of the vote, and we're at 25. So as we think about who's responsible, we're more responsible than most people. And, uh, and, and we also have the wealth to do something about it. So uh, just before the climate negotiations started, this report came out from the UN. The UN, you know, is one of these organizations that, no, that, that nobody at the UN wants to step on any country's toes. You, you, just, you, you never say anything that's going to, going to be critical of another country. That's, this is why this is such an amazing statement. We need to catch up on the years in which we procrastinated. That's a strong statement by a diplomat. And then to say this, Global greenhouse gas emissions must begin falling by 7.6% each year beginning in 2020, a rate currently nowhere in sight to meet the most ambitious aims of the Paris Agreement. You know, we're, we're, still, going, we're, we're still on the upward trend. We've got to be going down by this amount. That is a phenomenal challenge. And basically, then the report is, guess what? Last year, record high, uh, 2019. Well, in um, the end of 2018, this report came out from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Um, so to keep temperatures from rising excessively, meaning above the one and a half degrees, the, the 2.7 degrees Fahrenheit, um, global net anthropogenic carbon dioxide emissions must decline by about 45% from 2010 levels by 2030, reaching net zero around 2050. So what does that mean? It means that we've got to... Um, um, uh, re reduce 45% below, the, the difference between what we put in and what nature takes out has to decrease by 45% by, by uh, 2030, and it has to be no more than what nature can take out by 2050. So that's where forests come in, obviously, as you'll imagine this would do. So um, we must simultaneously reduce our emissions and increase the uptake by natural systems. So that's, the, that's, that's very explicit in this report. So we know how to reduce emissions. We all know how to do that, you know, and we, some of us are doing it and some of us aren't, but we all know how to do it, right? We, we'll use less, less, uh, less oil, we, we, you know, we, we'll get a more efficient vehicle. We'll, uh, we'll um, uh, you know, uh, turn down the thermostat or get one of those automatic fancy thermostats that goes up and down whenever it's supposed to. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll, 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 um, uh, replace all our light bulbs with uh, the LED lights. And those are all great things to do. Uh, or we'll maybe buy our electricity from renewable energy source. Or we'll install them on our own house. And maybe the company will pay for it. Or if we're fortunate enough, we'll pay for it. Uh, that that can all, all make the difference. But how do we increase the carbon dioxide removal rate from the atmosphere? And carbon dioxide is in the atmosphere. It, it was originally uh, down less than, than uh, it, it was 280 parts per million. That's point, less than 0.03%. But that's one of the main regulators of the temperature of the planet, both directly and then indirectly, because as the Earth warms, water evaporates from the ocean, and water vapor also traps heat. So... Every time we add an increment of carbon dioxide warming, we get double that warming because of the water vapor, the extra water vapor that goes in the atmosphere. So, uh, so how do we do this? Uh, every year, a group of uh, uh, associated with uh, Corinne Le Carré and 50 of her best friends in the scientific community, as I call them, get together and they say, what do we know about the carbon cycle? What's happening? And they just, and every year they put out a diagram like this with all the information. And I'll simplify it for you. I'll, I'll circle the key parts. So here are the emissions. So we're putting out 9.4 billion tons of carbon as carbon dioxide every year from our oil, coal, and gas, from the fossil fuels. And another one and a half billion tons, that little orange arrow, is coming from land conversion, from forests, cutting down forests for agriculture, that's particularly in Brazil, for example, or it's for urbanization. That's China. It's us in the United States. Uh, or for industrial, you know, we're going to build a factory here. Or here in Berkshire County, it's to install solar panels. 
right? Wait a minute, wait a minute. We need more solar panels, but do we need to cut down forests to do them? No. <laughs> uh, I'm a great supporter of more solar energy, but putting, cutting down forests to do it is not on my to-do list. Uh, so the question is, how much is the increase in carbon dioxide in the atmosphere if we're putting 10.9 billion tons in every year? It's 4.7. This is not a miracle. This is physics. This is physics and chemistry. What happened? What happened is that plants on land, mostly forests, sucked up 3.2 billion, and oceans and plants in oceans sucked up 2.4 billion, more than they were putting out or taking in. So it's so a, a surplus. You add that all up. And that's the missing piece. That's the missing amount. There's another little 0.6 there that we're not quite sure what that is. We think it's probably the fact that as the Earth is warming and warming more in the Arctic, a lot more trees and things are, move, are, are growing further north. And, but it's, a, it's kind of a thin fuzz, and it's kind of hard to track it all down. So anyway, but it is plants. Now, forests are the biggest part of this on the land part. Forests are absorbing about 25% of, of what we put in every year. And in the process, every, every carbon dioxide molecule they absorb, they give us back an oxygen molecule. It's a really nice thing to do, and we really appreciate it. So you're getting a twofer from your forests here. They're sucking up carbon dioxide, and they're giving us oxygen to breathe. So if we can do this, um, what do we have to do? Well, replace burning fossil fuels for energy. Also we should stop burning wood for energy on a commercial scale. Wood releases more carbon dioxide for the amount of heat that it releases or the amount of electricity it generates than does coal. That's really disappointing to learn. Now, I'm not saying if you have a nice fireplace and a nice little wood stove, you shouldn't use it. That's not what this is about. That's such a small amount, it doesn't matter. And uh, particularly if you use, uh, instead of using live trees or cutting down live trees for your firewood, you go, I mean, and we've had a lot of deadfall lately from all the windstorms we've had. Pick up the deadfall, use that. Make sure you have a really efficient stove. If you can, get an air, outdoor air intake. That makes it even more efficient. And, um, and you'll be warm and comfortable on maybe half the wood you're using now if you, if you really do all that right. But it's these big, big industrial scale efforts that are the problem. Um, so we need to then reduce emissions from conversion of forest lands, wetlands and grasslands to do these things and maintain the natural systems to increase their, their, uh, uh, their potential. When I got into this, I mean, I worked a lot on how do we, I mean, I started uh, in 1988 on, you know, will there ever be enough solar panels that are cheap enough to make, a, make any difference? That's what it was then. Uh, I now live in a house that's solar powered and uh, and super efficient and so forth. So all that technology has come to be, and the prices have come down dramatically, and the subsidies are pretty good for those things. So uh, take a look at it, and we have, have have some great local installers, by the way, of solar panels in the in this area. Uh, so I came across uh, this article: um, existing forests and grasslands can remove twice as much atmospheric carbon as they currently do. This is worldwide. Why is that? It's because of the way we manage them, right? So this suggests maybe we could manage them differently and how will we deal with the competing uses? And that'll be kind of the rest of my presentation here. A second thing, um, I, I, um, I, I'm having a wonderful time. I'm working with, with uh, forest ecologists, uh, people at schools of forestry, um, uh, wetland scientists, um, and, and they're a lot more fun than the laboratories I used to work in because uh, uh, there you get to go tromp, tromp around in swamps and go hiking in forests and measure trees. And it's, it's wonderful stuff to, to, to get into. But uh, these, uh, these wetlands um, store vast amounts of carbon, and yet we've always considered wetlands as wastelands. And so we fill them in, you know, we bulldoze them over, and at that moment they release a lot of carbon. And they've been accumulating it since the end of the last ice age. So 10,000 years of carbon storage can go out in one bulldozer run. So just rethinking these things is, is important. And um, 
a colleague of mine at Oregon State University College of Forestry, Beverly Law, makes this profound statement that people often miss. Just remember, carbon in forests and soils is carbon not in the atmosphere, right? It's, if, so that's the more we can get the forest to grow, the more we'll have out of the atmosphere. And here is another study that really, this all, all these papers came out in 2018 and 2019. Um, the, in, in a, the largest 1%, this is a direct quote from the article, the largest 1% of trees in mature and older forests comprise 50% of forest biomass worldwide. That means the wood. There's, the most wood is in the biggest out of 100 trees in a mature forest. That means big trees are important to keep and uh, not to be the ones that we should be harvesting for other purposes. Um, and this study was done on 48 sites around the world. One of those sites is Harvard Forest, which is one of the most studied forests for the last 100 years since it was founded in the world. Um, other studies, uh, Bill Keaton up at, at uh, University of Vermont, New England forests can store between 2.4 and 4.3 times their current rate. In other words, our forests are of an age where if we'd let them keep growing, they would store a lot of carbon. And um, I've just learned that, uh, you may have seen this, that Microsoft is not only going to be carbon neutral, they're going to be carbon negative, and they are going to remove from the atmosphere all the carbon they have put in since the company was founded in 1975. And they're going to spend money on getting technologies to do it, but since those technologies don't exist, they're going to do it with, you guessed it, forests. And some of those forests are apparently in the northeast United States. I haven't been able, I've been trying to find out where they are, but I haven't been able to find that out. So, um, planting trees is good. And there's nothing that makes anybody feel better than planting a tree. It just, you know, there's just something about it that's very, very, very pleasing and, 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 and uh, pragmatic. But letting them grow is better. And I'll show you why that is the case in just a moment. So we've termed this idea of proforestation to, uh, to compare it to afforestation and reforestation. Reforestation is you plant a forest after it's been cut down. Afforestation is you go find a place that doesn't have trees and you plant them there. And proforestation is um, uh, allowing forests to reach their biological and ecological potential for carbon storage in the trees and the soils in Older forests, there is more carbon stored in the soils from all those composted leaves and so on year after year after year. You know, when you go walking in the woods, you know, all those leaves fell off last fall, but you know you're not up to your waist in leaves because they're in the soil. They've become they've begun soil carbon. And um, the larger trees in their prime growth period remove the most atmospheric carbon each year and store the carbon in the wood, the limbs, the branches, and so on. And... Um, What's really important here, as you'll see, is how much is stored. So I've been doing some work with a, with a fellow named Bob Leverett, who some of you may know, who is a retired Air Force engineer whose hobby is measuring trees. And uh, uh, when I met Bob, we hit it off right away. I said, Bob, I need, I need to know how big these trees are and, and we can figure out how much carbon's in them. So I've been going out with him in forest in, in western Massachusetts, and in particular the ones just over 20 miles over the mountain in, uh, in uh, Mohawk Trail State Forest and Savoy State Forest and Monroe State Forest. There's some very big, large trees there. Um, and this is on a per acre basis. These are white pines, and these were nearly probably pure white pine stands when they started. Some of them die off, other trees come in. This is only looking at what the original trees that were there at time zero at the beginning, okay? So after 50 years, this stand, these, this stand of white pines has about 22 tons of carbon per acre because half of wood by weight is carbon, right? It's just part of the building, building material of, of wood, wood fibers and trees. Um, and um, so if we... Um, harvest at that point and use that maybe for paper, maybe for some lumber, maybe for, for, a, 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 for, a, for fuel wood, for a power plant or something, uh, we go to zero right away, right, in there. And, and the question is, what happens to the rest? Well, 
if we wait 50 years and all goes well, we'll be back to 22 tons in 50 years. Now, you know, there's no guarantee it'll go well. We know there's so many diseases and all these other things. Happening. Let's assume it goes perfectly. We'll have 22 tons. What would we have if we had let that forest grow? 47 tons. That's 47 tons that's not in the atmosphere. And I'm not even counting the soil. I'm not counting the other trees that may be growing there. I'm just counting these original pine trees. And if we repeat this cycle again and we cut them every 50 years, that's a, that's a, that's a you know, rotation cycle in forestry, I'm back to 22 tons again finally. I was at zero and now I'm back to 20. I go from 22 to zero, 22 to zero, 22. And then how much would I have if I had let it keep growing? I'd have 76, almost 76 tons. That's 76 tons that's not in the atmosphere. Okay? So that's, that's this idea of proforestation, of letting some amount of our forests continue to grow to be able to, to, to do this. And there will be a lot more in the older forests in the soils than there is in the younger forests. And when you cut trees, there is always a loss of carbon from the soils. So this is a, a, just a way of showing it. Here's another way. This is uh, work done actually in the 1990s. If you look at the, at the top, on, on the, the left-hand side, that's how much carbon was in this forest. This is out in the Pacific Northwest. And um, it was cut. So if it had continued to grow, they assumed it would kind of stay pretty constant, maybe go up and down a little bit. There's a wind tree blown down. There's a something, lightning strikes a tree, whatever it is, but a new one's come back. And <clears throat> then you let it grow back for, I think in this case, it's a 60-year cycle, but pretty much what I had before. And then you cut it again. And then you grow it and cut it again. And what you can see, the red line is to indicate just a rough eyeball average. If you say, what's the average here? The average is lower than the peaks you get to when it grows back, right? So that average is always lower. And that's true of the previous thing I showed you as well. All right. What about, though, that, that we cut? Suppose it goes into forest products. It goes into, into building a house. Um, uh, and um, uh, again, working with, uh, with uh, some colleagues at schools of forestry, one at uh, Tara Hudderberg is at, uh, at uh, um, Idaho State University and Beverly Law, the person I mentioned earlier, is at Oregon State University College of Forestry, did a full analysis of the state of Oregon. This is the only place in the world that has had this complete a study done. So what happened to the carbon that's in long-lived products? And the answer is just 20% of it is around 115 years later. So starting in 1900 and going to 2015, that's our data time, only 20% only of it is still in long-lived products. You know, we tend to think, well, it's in a long, it's in a house, it'll be there forever. No, it's not there forever. The average turnover rate for houses in the United States is 50 years. Most wooden houses are torn down on average, at least, or I shouldn't say most. The average is every, every 50 years, 2% a year are gone which means they have an average life of 50 years. And so that ends up in a, in, in a landfill. So another 20% is the landfill, and 60% is in the atmosphere. So the argument that we're going to get a lot of carbon storage in wood products has to be looked at really carefully, really carefully. My call on this is let's do the numbers. Let's make sure we have this right. Um, <clears throat> and... Um, uh, Mark Harmon, who is also out at, at Oregon in the School of Forestry, uh, College of Forestry, he has just published a paper looking at all the things that you make out of wood and what their carbon intensity is and compares it to other building materials. Because the argument is wood is a better, from a carbon point of view, building material than concrete and steel and other, other materials. His conclusion is that the estimates for the carbon impact of the wood is overestimated by factors of two to 100, depending on the particular item. That says we, maybe he's wrong, but what it says is we ought to go back and check that out because we better get these numbers right. Because if we're gonna make the claim that this wood product is gonna be around for and be this much better than anything else, and by the way, you know, the frame of my house is made of wood, uh, and, uh, and, and as I'm sure most of your yours houses are as well, 
um, you know, uh, it doesn't mean we don't use it, but we just have to account for it properly. And um, one way to do that, of course, is to have longer harvest cycles. The longer the harvest cycle, the more, on average, that red line will be of that zigzag curve. It'll be more averaged in the in the forest than in the, the than in the atmosphere. And um, if we could reduce the use of things, there's something we can do: single-use paper products, paper towels, Kleenex, disposable diapers. Toilet paper. Toilet paper, if you look, if you go to the Stop and Shop or, or Y and look at the toilet paper, they brag it comes from the great North Woods. There's even pictures of Northern Woods creatures on it and so forth. Those trees that they're harvesting are between 200 and 400 years old. One use, and we flush it. At the very least, we should use the, I mean, I'm not ready to give that up, by the way. <laughs> Uh, but what we could do is those could be made from recycled fiber, not from 100, 200-year-old trees. So just thinking about these things, you suddenly, suddenly this, I only figured this out a few months ago, so, you know, I'm not, I mean, it's not surprising if you haven't thought about it. Uh, here's another study that really shocked me. Um, if you look at the losses, uh, the, the carbon emissions from forest, it's... Uh, it's uh, insects and fire and wind and drought and conversion to other uses, other land uses. That's 15% of the emissions. 85% is associated with the harvesting process itself. And if you look at the total amount, these are all figures from the US EPA. Um, in, in 2016 is the most recent year I could get these comparisons, so it's probably not changed much since then. Forest harvesting released 162 million metric tons of carbon that year, which is more than all of the emissions from oil burning and gas burning to heat our houses and our, our, our commercial buildings. That's just astounding, right? Forest service, uh, the forest industry, uh, just, just the process is releasing that much carbon. And there are bio biodiversity uh, benefits to older forests. You know, birds are a good indicator of forest health, and North American populations declined by almost 3 billion birds, and 1 billion of those are forest species. That suggests that we're not really managing our forests in a very sustainable way. Um, so um, uh, what's happened is that the way we've been managing forests has decreased the species richness of trees, plants, Fungi, who knew fungi were important? Uh, it turns out in a forest they're hugely important to the viability and the, and the, uh, the growth rate of trees. Uh, and uh, all that disappears when we, when we harvest too frequently. And uh, I think that there are, talk to foresters, there are ways to change these practices that would, uh, would make, make forests, even production forests, much more um, uh, friendly to uh, these the biological diversity. So we need more forests that are composed of older trees. That's from this paper in 2019. This is just showing another paper that came out in 2014 showing that wildland forests, the total density of birds, the total number of bird species, and the abundance of individual species goes up in wildland forests and down in managed forests. And uh, we, we actually manage some forests for particular species by keeping them at early successional stages, but it only works for a few species. Uh, even Mass Audubon does this. Uh, but we need to think about this more carefully. And here's just an example of one of our older, fo older forest species, the barred owl, which you know I'm sure any of you who live out in the country at all uh, hear, hear them all the time. It's great. It's great that they're around. It says our forests are pretty healthy. Let's just take a look at forest cover around the canopy cover around the world. And uh, sure enough, Brazil, you can see there, has a lot of, uh, a lot of um, uh, loss. Um, but so does Sw Sweden and Finland, which are great forestry countries. But they really don't manage forests. They manage tree plantations. There are really not forests there anymore. Uh, and uh, the thing that shocked me when I saw this was the most Canopy loss in the world is in the United States. So it's a diversion for us to keep worrying about what's happening in the rainforest. That is a problem, but we've got our own problem. 
And uh, the reason for that is uh, the South produces more timber, more pulp, and now more pellets for bioenergy than any other place on Earth. And it is really, um, and, and so they, they try harder and harder. They pump more fertilizer into those, plant, those, those tree farms. They cut down the last of the, uh, of the wetland forests and things to get at it. And uh, on the other hand, uh, this is just showing what's happened to our original old growth forest, 1620 a date I think everybody knows, you know, you know uh, Plymouth Rock and all that stuff. Uh, th this is what, this was the forest cover in the upper left. By 1850, this is what had happened to the old growth forest. I mean, this looks like, uh, you know, your, uh, your, your, your favorite uh, wool blanket with the, after the moths have gotten into it, right? It's, it's just full of holes. By 1820s, and 1850 was kind of the end of sheep culture in New England, and that's when our forest started growing back. Uh, but still, in terms of old growth forest, 1926 and today, there's only one little spot in the east, and you probably can't even see it. It's in upper New York State. That's the Adirondacks. It's the Adirondacks State Forest. That's the only place that we have of any full-scale old-growth forest. We have a few old-growth remnants here. There, there, there's, there, there are a couple of them on Mount Greylock in spruce forests. Uh, there are a couple of them in Mohawk Trail State Forest and Monroe State Forest, but they're small areas. I mean, not big enough to show up on this map, unfortunately. And what that's done is to give us a, a, an age distribution. Just look at the blue line. That's us. Uh, where the average age is somewhere 65, 70 years. That, I mean, they're, they're most tree, I mean, that's the median age kind of. And then on either side of that by 20 years or so, that's kind of the bulk of our, of our trees. Well, that's just the age when they are going to be growing the fastest and start sucking up the most carbon. So that means our forests are uniquely qualified to be carbon storers, carbon sucker uppers. And you may hear a talk about, we're going to have some machine that's going to do this. That's a long ways off. <laughs> and so here's just looking at forest cover in the northeast. And this is from the Forest Service. This is showing the carbon density. And uh, I'll put this in. in oops. Um, uh, so the purple color means very low, 40 tons per hectare, but which is something like 18 tons per acre. And 131 tons at the top is something like 58 uh, tons per acre. So look at Maine. It has really very little carbon in its forest. It's been pulped forever and logged forever, and the trees have never gotten big enough back again to store much carbon. Look at the big green spot in western New England, western Massachusetts, from northwest Connecticut up into southern Vermont, New Hampshire. That's us. We have some of the most carbon-dense forests in the whole northeast. And the other big spot is just to the west of it. That's the Adirondack State Park. So we have a real asset here. Uh, I'm working with people at the Woods Hole Research Center who have a technique now from satellites. They can tell how much carbon there is per acre using this satellite data. Not just the tree cover, but how much wood is underneath it. And uh, the yellow is the highest. That's more than 40 tons of carbon per acre. And look at the area in central Massachusetts around Quabbin. And a little bit to the west in Franklin and Hampshire counties. In Berkshire counties, we're lower than that in most places. There are a few places in southern Berkshire County that are that high. Um, but we're, we're pretty high compared to other places. The, by the way, the dark blue, those are urban areas. So you can see North Adams and Williamstown there in the upper left and, and the Boston megalopolis on the right. Now, this just shows the changes that have taken place. And one of the things I'll, I shouldn't take time with this, but you see the strange red line at the bottom? Does anybody remember there was that linear tornado that came whipping along there? It shows up. It shows up. So this is the change between 2003 and 2016, and uh, that shows up. What's interesting is we're not doing very well in Western, Western Massachusetts in terms of increases. The increases are all in the eastern part of the state. They have the lowest carbon density, but they have the greatest increases. And if we look at it over the whole state, the green are the gains, and those have dropped from over 400,000 um, metric tons uh, to closer to 300. It's ticked up a little bit in 2015. But the losses have gotten much worse in the last uh, 10 years. And so the blue line 
are, is the net, between, the difference between the gains and losses. And we are, we are still in positive territory. We're still gaining, but we're in a declining situation net. That's not the direction we need to be going. We need to have that net going up. In other words, where the nature is uh, making headway and uh, so on. So climate negotiators have noted this. Sustaining an increasing force is vital to get on track in time to meet the Paris Climate Change Agreement's goals. And uh, the math of climate science shows that meeting this goal is impossible without nurturing forests, which from the atmosphere's point of view are a massive sink of carbon locked up in trees, plants, and the soil, and a source of oxygen through photosynthesis. I can't believe that this is what diplomats are saying, but we've educated them. <laughs> they, they've, they, they've gotten the message. And uh, other people who are involved in this are just talking about our, the forests worldwide are being decimated, and we need to get, uh, this is the head of, uh, of uh, 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 International Union of Conservation of Nature, and um, nature-based solutions such as protecting and restoring forests can contribute to over one-third of the total climate change mitigation required by 2030. It's not the answer, but it is a big part of the answer, right? A third? Boy, if I can get a third of anything, it seems to me it's worth looking at. Well, let me just quickly run through. Here's the, here's the, the, the COP that was supposed to take place in Chile. It was supposed to take place in Brazil before that. Brazil, the new president said, I don't believe in climate change, so we're not going to host the meeting. That's a very undiplomatic thing to do in international relations, I'll tell you right now. The president of Chile said, we'll do it. And then they had the riots in Chile. And she called up about six weeks before it was to take place and said, we can't do it. The prime minister of Spain said, well, everything you've prepared is in Spanish. Bring it to Spain. We'll do it here. And I must say the Spaniards did a fabulous job. I don't know how they did it in six weeks. I mean, there were 26,000 people at this conference. And it was terrific. So the point of all this negotiation is basically to... Um, is to, is, uh, to uh, achieve stabilization of greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere at a level that would prevent dangerous anthropogenic interference with the climate system. That's the goal of the whole international system. And so we get to Spain, and here are all the diplomats there, and they're setting up to do this great thing. And meanwhile, <laughs> on Friday night, hundreds of thousands of people in the streets of Madrid, uh, you know, save the planet climate change, families, um, groups of, 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 of workers of different, different uh, you know, carpenters, uh, uh, masons. Um, it was amazing. It was really fascinating to be out there in the middle of all that. So um, unfortunately, another year wasted in Madrid. They could not get agreement on, of all things, carbon accounting for forests. It was really terrible. Brazil wanted to double count. They wanted to sell. You could buy, I'll protect your forest, and I'll give you $100, and you'll protect some part of your forest. All right, that's fine. But then they wanted to count that for themselves as well. That's called double counting. The atmosphere doesn't double count. And, uh, and uh, the, the uh, Australians uh, uh, basically tried to shift the baseline so it would be more favorable to them. Meanwhile, their forests are burning. I was with two couple of Australians. They had an app on their phone the whole time that told how close the fire was to their house. So here they are, people who worked on this for 25, 30 years, and they have to check to see whether their house is burned down yet every day, several times a day. Um, and then the U.S. blocked uh, any uh, any any uh, developing countries who go you know go under the waves uh, out in the Pacific Ocean or the Caribbean or something from getting any compensation for that or any help in moving. Uh, the Times of London, good headline, COP out. It's called Conference of the Parties, COP. Very, very cute. Uh, it's now up to Britain to rescue the UN's climate agenda because the UK will be the chair of this next year. Uh, and uh, so it just says they've got to do it. And Boris Johnson says they will. So it'll be in Glasgow in the January. That doesn't sound very appealing. And we will be, we will be raising our ambitions. After 26 years, we'll be raising our ambitions. You know, uh, so this says we really need to do uh, better than this. And uh, let's just recognize that the climate has changed. And I'll just quickly just show, you know, this is California in 2019. Uh, this was Australia on New Year's Eve. I don't know who got this photo with a kangaroo there with the buildings burning behind it. Um, as I said, Australia doubled their emissions just with the fires in their forests. But we were having troubles here, too. This was Boston in January 2018. 
I don't know if you've ever been down by the aquarium. That, by the way, on the left is the entrance to the T, the subway. Uh, ice flows blowing through the streets as the ocean rose up. And uh, just north of Boston, how would you like to live in this house, right? I love living next to the ocean. Well, maybe not. Uh, so this was in, in uh, Situate. Uh, we've been getting more intense downpours in the Northeast, more than any place else in the country. You may have ex noticed that. And uh, this was in Worcester in, that, uh, in, in uh, 2018. Uh, I, I, it's a great photo with the Providence of Wor Worcester rusting uh, a bridge on top, and then two people who wanted to be submarine pilots instead of car drivers who went into the underpass. Uh, just I'll close with uh, forest climate issues for Massachusetts. One is the uh, proposal to build this wood-burning electric power plant down in, near Springfield. Uh, and uh, it'll be subsidized by you and me on our electric bills. Um, we'll be paying for it. And uh, there's no reason for it. Of course, being built in a low-income part of the city, mostly people of color, but, you know, it's just the way it is in this world. Uh, and uh, the air pollutants are really bad. Um, uh, there's a bill before the legislature, H 853, that would simply take the subsidies away from, from these large scale projects. And I think that, I, I, I don't know that it will pass, but it's being pushed pretty hard by a lot of people. Um, the American Lung Association and a half a dozen others, the American Academy of Pediatrics, points out that the air pollution from burning, burning wood and this kind of plants is worse than any other air pollution there is. The particles are so fine. They not only go into your lungs, they cross the blood-brain barrier and the placental barrier and everything else, go into every organ in your body, and, uh, and they often carry toxic materials with them. So we're losing forwards, uh, lands to solar panels, and uh, so how should they be managed? And this is where I'll close, is, uh, uh, you know, what, what role should our state and municipal forests play? In, uh, in managing for climate change? And how might private landowners be compensated uh, for keeping their forests standing either longer or indefinitely to absorb carbon? Uh, it's the cheapest thing we can do, by the way. It is really inexpensive to do this. Uh, and um, so the U.S. Forest Service, just so you know, classifies Western Massachusetts forests, 90 per, over 90% of it, as timberlands. That's not subtle. That's not subtle at all. And uh, uh, they uh, are now on the governance committee of something called the Mohawk Woodland, uh, Mohawk Trail Woodland Partnership alongside several forestry industry representatives. Uh, and just to show you where that is, 21 towns, North Adams and Williamstown have joined. Uh, I think there are about a dozen or 13 who have joined. And um, it's, a lot of, it's a lot of area. This is a, just a bigger map showing it. Uh, and uh, so far, they haven't gotten any money to do this, what they plan to do, but they're, it's really about doing more forestry. And they talk a little bit about some other things, but it's really about doing more forestry in this area. So here's my proposed plan. It's very simple. Let more forests grow to meet their ecological potential for storing carbon to address climate change and, and, be, and biological diversity through proforestation management and then continue to measure other forests for production. And I've talked to some foresters and people at uh, New England Forestry Foundation, and they're pushing this second item. I was hoping to get them to agree to the other one. They've not agreed to that so far, but anyway, we're still on having ongoing conversation. And um, then ultimately, it's the public that needs to decide uh, what we do. Uh, you've probably heard of this young lady. Uh, she's quite... Adults keep saying, you, we owe it to the young people to give them hope. I don't want your hope. I want you to act. I want you to act as if the house was on fire, because it is. And when I was in Madrid, I had this extraordinary experience of being on a panel with Greta. She would organize it, got five scientists, two of the leaders of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and three actually Boston area scientists. I don't know how we got such a terrific balance of the best science out there, uh, being from Boston. And uh, that's uh, Luisa Neubauer, who's the uh, young German woman. And so let me just close with that. Let it grow, and thank you. So 
the plan for the Q&A is if there are some specific um, clarifying questions that we have uh, for Bill, um, to direct those first to Bill, and then we're actually also going to bring uh, Frank up to join Bill so that uh, both can respond to questions uh, from the audience. So um, I'll let you take Okay, questions. sure, sure. Anyone have any or comments or whatever you'd like to say? Yes. Uh, I'm, I'm curious about um, uh, factors uh, considered for um, current emissions to timber harvest you know, operations, whether is that mostly due to the soil disturbance? disturbance to do skidding and cording, or is that taking account trucking? It, it includes the trucking and the, you know, the chainsaws or the big machines if they're used. Uh, but, but it's also the soil, it's, so it's both the process and the, the emissions from the soil. Uh, soil is a big one. And then, of course, the, there's, there's a lot of a tree that doesn't go into, into product, right? I mean, it's the, the, particularly if it's one of these kind of trees, you know, you only get this part of the tree for that. And uh, so there's a lot that, uh, that ends up and ends up with a lot of that goes back into the soil. Absolutely right, and that's essential to have some of that go back into the soil. Absolutely right. Yeah. Yes, sir. Was that uh, similar to my kind of thought? Is that are those figures also looking at just overall the net loss and not accounting for the uh, sequestration that we're generating for it? That's that's right. These are these are the actual emissions, and then then the the uh, the sequestration is in another column. Right. I mean, we need. To, I think we need to keep these straight so we know which ones, which one we're working with. And so th these are just the losses. In the, in the one I showed for Massachusetts as a whole, I showed you the gains and the losses and the net. Um, but this is just the losses, just just what's going into the atmosphere. Yes, sir. How do you account for leakage when you um, tie up our forests <clears throat> and? But yet we continue to consume forest products that we right. acquire from all over the world. Right. What have we gained? Well, <clears throat> the answer to that is we are nowhere we are nowhere close to the maximum where it's a one for one trade off. In other words, there is more than enough. The United States is the largest producer of timber products in the world. We we, we produce more more lumber than anybody. We don't import very much wood from Brazil or the Philippines or any place else. We do import, I, I, this is strange, when I was building my house, I went up, I, I said, I want as much local timber as possible, right? I, I, I bought from, uh, um, from right over here in, in uh, Charlemont, and I, I bought wherever I could, but I couldn't get all of it that way, so some of it came from Quebec. Uh, but I was really shocked one day when I found a two by four from the Czech Republic. Now, why in the world do I have a two by four from the Czech Republic? I don't need a two by four from the Czech Republic. It's my understanding that roughly 6% of the forest products that we use in Massachusetts yep. come from Massachusetts. Yep. So 94% comes from somewhere else. And do you know where 90% of the, of the logs that are harvested in Massachusetts go? Canada. Quebec. They go to Canada. On their way to the rest of the world. To, to, to anywhere. Yeah. So, so, you know, if, we, if it's really important to us that we, we just don't have the capacity uh, in sawmills and, and uh, manufacturing, you know, uh, uh, Gardner is no longer the furniture capital of New England. Uh, if we could bring some of that back and if we brought so, used some of those logs here, it would be a different story. But I, so the leakage is actually the other way around. It's not, it's not that... That, that the leakage is that, that they're going someplace else because we're not selling it to them here. We, we're deliberately, our whole economic system is set up to export it to Canada because that's where the highest prices are. But, but it, it's still even that amount that's being exported is a fraction of what we consume. It's not like... Sure, but look, look, we, 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 don't, we don't produce all our food here either. You know, we're not capable of it. We, 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 have, we have six and a half or seven million people. We don't have, and we're a tiny state. So, uh, so but, but we are still not even at capacity in this state or in this country with the use of wood. So we could divide it in half and have half of it for protecting the, the climate and half of it for production forests, and we would be just fine economically. We could do it. We would not have to import from anybody else. But the, the U.S. Forest Service has a whole office to export things. 
They want us to cut down our trees, chip them up, and send them to Japan and China for birding for bioenergy. I just think that's crazy. That's a real waste. Yes, others. Yes, sir. Um, can you speak to invasive plants? Yeah. And um, so much of our forest seems to me in its farms that have been let go. Right. And then in come the invasives, plus trees are trying to grow. Yeah. Yeah. Is there a substantial possibility to increase carbon in your own backyard by removing the invasives? It'll make your trees grow better. I mean, will you get, yeah. is that a... Yeah, a, I mean, a, uh, get rid of the... It, by the way, the invasives are a relatively recent thing. I mean, there weren't invasives when the forests were cleared in 1850. We've done all this to ourselves in the last few decades, frankly. Right? We've, we've brought them in from all over. Uh, some of them were ornamental plants. The one that really gets me is they brought in some rhododendrons from Asia into California, which has some kind of a virus that could destroy every oak tree in North America. All for How much money did that bring? I mean, how, what, what is the economic uh, cost-benefit on that? It just. But anyway, if you have buckthorn or if you have... Uh, um, uh, uh, Japanese not, uh, barberry or whatever it is, you know, take it out, and you just have to keep at it. I've, I've been I've been going for 11 years on uh, on uh, a Japanese uh, knotweed in one place, and uh, I'm I, I'm I'm down to about one new stalk a year now. So I think I'm making progress from the hundred that were there before. Yeah. Um, well, I wanted to also invite yeah. uh, Frank Lowenstein to uh, yeah. join up here for uh, some more general questions. Yeah. Um, I don't know if it's a question for both of them, or, um, but I actually have two questions. Um, sure. One, in the interest of you know the people who depend on work for a livelihood, and yep. also our desire to have local wood products. You know, how much how much research is out there looking at sustainable forest management practices that will? Is it possible to to sequester more carbon than is released when we cut down a tree and use it? Is that how? or will it all be released when we harvest it and use it? Uh, if we burn it, it's released immediately. Yeah. That, that we know. Frank, do you want to that? Yeah, um, so it's definitely possible through the practice of silviculture, which is forest science, the science of forestry, to grow more wood than we're growing. So the, the stat, uh, and by the way, I, that was a great presentation, Bill. And I, I agreed with about 90% of it. Um, we'll we'll so, work on the other 10. Yeah. We'll get it. So, if, you, if you want a mic, that was also on. Up oh. to you. I don't okay. do, I don't, can people hear me in the back? Yeah. Now I can. Now you can. Speak okay, up. I'll speak loudly. So uh, the 10% I didn't agree with, Bill, on, you have to wait till February to learn what it is. Okay. Uh, but one of, the, one of the facts that Bill shared is Bill Keaton's figure that we could sequester, I think it was 2.4 to 4.3 4. or something. Yeah. yeah uh, times more carbon in the forest. Part of that, in Bill's calculations, is by practicing silviculture, by practicing yep. the way that you accelerate the growth of the forest. All of you have probably had the experience of planting a row of spinach and you forget to thin it. And after a few weeks, you have a, a zillion little spindly spinach plants that you can't really do anything with. Whereas your row that you did make time to thin, you have these big, beautiful, bushy spinach plants. It's the same thing in the forest. So there are ways to grow more wood faster. And then if you want to continue this have the, to harvest wood so that you have local wood products or so that you don't have the leakage problem that Dick and Crane spoke to, which, which is real. The, the global stats are that if you stop harvesting in one place, all you do is 90% of that harvest is displaced to somewhere else in the world. So we don't really solve the problem by stopping harvesting here. It's just going to be harvested somewhere else perhaps from those 400-year-old trees in Canada that, that Bill spoke to, or perhaps from tropical rainforests and tropical forest systems that sequester much more carbon per acre than our forests do. So we have to, be, we have to pay attention to the details, another thing that I really agree with. Um, so we could, if we practice better forestry, we could have more carbon in the forest and still harvest wood products and maybe even have more wood products and maybe steer more of those wood products into long-lived products instead of 
single-use products or other rapidly uh, emitted things. By the way, if any of you were disturbed by Bill's toilet paper uh, <laughs> point, I, I am too. Um, it is worth noting that Trader Joe's uh, makes a 100% recycled toilet paper that's excellent. <laughs> we can drive too far to get it. Yeah, there's a problem. Well, we'll get somebody. Hey, this is a business opportunity for somebody. <laughs> yes. I just wanted to say uh, thank you, Frank, for that explanation. And two, I think, like, I really hope that we can focus on the fact that I would much rather have a future um, that would save an acre of forest land versus something that's going to be converted. And even if that acre of forest land is like horribly mismanaged, it's going to still be a forest. Like if that's much more, like that's what that seems like a, a future I'd be looking more to something that's like paved. Well, that, that's right. I mean, the, the um, um, I mean, every tree is storing carbon when it's when it's standing, and even when it's dead in the forest, it's storing carbon. And and I don't know, but I mean, I own, I own a little bit of forest land. I've got some. Some down trees that are—I mean, they were—they were there when I bought the property uh, 20 years ago, and and they'll be there for 20, 30, 40 years more before they've actually and decayed. And by then, they, most of that will have gone into soil. It will not just be going into carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Um, I, I think, I, I, Frank, I hope you got the point that I made. That I, I, I'm agreeing with you that that uh, we should be we could we could manage. The forest we're, we're managing for production, but we also need to have you know that 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 will that can be done better. I mean, and we have the examples side by side, Maine and us, yeah. and it's like night and day. It is like night and day. And uh, uh, I, I know that, uh, I, I, that the New England Forest Foundation is trying to work with uh, landowners up there to get them to manage more longer rotations and not just coming in and running and cut it when it's just barely big enough to make a few bucks at the, at the mill. Uh, another, another point that you spoke to that I think we would agree on, you spoke to the efficiency for the, that we could pay landowners to store more carbon on yep. their land and that would probably be a very efficient approach. Um, we really think that's true. We have a project ongoing in western Maine where we're asking landowners, uh, what would we have to pay you in order for you to um, leave older trees on your land, leave older stands intact, to really get at that question of what would this cost on a per acre basis. Meanwhile, we've also done an analysis where the, this question about what's better forestry look like. Um, we've done that analysis for northern New England. We have a session coming up in a few weeks to begin analyzing it for southern New England. But for northern New England, for the three northern New England states, if you took New England Forestry Foundation's exemplary forestry standards and you applied them across all three states, over time, you would store an additional 1.9 billion tons of carbon in the woods, in living forests, and still be deriving some, uh, some um, product. Uh, so, in fact, you'd be deriving higher quality products that are more suited to lumber as opposed to pulp, which is most of what... Which is lower value. Which is lower value and most of what Maine is managed for. Right. Now, in order to get there, right now you have landowners who are counting on selling their pulp. And if they're not going to sell their pulp, A, we have to figure out where the pulp is going to come from so that we all do have toilet paper. And B, we have to figure out how we're going to pay those landowners because they're not just going to sit there and stop <coughs> using their land for the next 20 years. As the gentleman in the back, I think, was alluding to, they're probably going to sell their land for development if they can't derive any income from it. And then instead of having forest, we have not forest. So... You know, there's there's a lot of complexities to how we approach this. Yes. I have um, like a two part question. So one can like trees grow slow generally, so like can we get there quick enough with yes. the, the then yeah. and the other question kind of related to invasives and, and management, if you are managing say a like in a reserve, it doesn't necessarily mean like you're not maybe cutting anything. There might still be some management prescriptions that you can do. 
and thinking about, you know, I manage a lot of land that, you know, I look at the forest re regeneration or lack of forest regeneration in some of my forest reserves, and I think about deer browse, um, invasives, and earthworms, and parasitogistic effects, yep. and kind of like, how do you wrap your head around that? How do you, do we need to speed up the regeneration of our forest reserves, and what are the best management prescriptions we need? Well, that, that, that's where that's where I think uh, you know there's a, a hugely important role for foresters to play because uh, they've been managing forests uh, to grow them as rapidly as possible to be cut down for product. But they could also be manage them more rapidly for carbon storage uh, and or a combination of the two. And uh, I think that's you know to, that's where I'm coming from. Is I'm not saying you know let's all stop using wood. Uh, and, and let's never cut another tree. That's not my agenda at all. It's really, here's why it's an emergency. If we don't take care of this soon, we're already seeing it. The fires in California, the fires in Portugal, the fires in Australia are the result of these climate change induced droughts. And there's good evidence that this is tied to the change, those changes. It's the, it's the change in the weather patterns, right? We have changed the jet stream. That's why we're getting these strange weather patterns. That's why we get. That's why they get snow in Texas. Is because the jet stream has been so disrupted. It goes all the way down to Texas, and the cold air falls in behind it. So you know, people say, "Oh, how can it be getting warmer if I'm getting snow in Texas?" Well, that's how you do it. The, the, the heat disrupted the, the whole the whole district, the whole um, uh, circulation system of the atmosphere. So we've got to get this. We've got to get this rising temperature under control as rapidly as possible, are there not going to be forests for wood products or for carbon sequestration? I just want to add a couple of quick things in response to Angela's question. And by the way, uh, Elena gave me credit for founding the Berkshire Taconic Landscape Program of the Nature Conservancy. Angela is the current head of the Berkshire Taconic Landscape Good. Program of the Nature Conservancy, and she's doing a great job. Um, so, uh, First of all, you asked, can we do it fast enough? You hear a lot of people say, let's plant trees. President Trump Great. said, let's plant a trillion trees yeah. when he was in Davos. Yeah. As far as I'm concerned, that's an excuse to not do what exactly. we really need to do. Exactly. Because when you start with a tree this big, it's a really long time before it's sequestering a lot of carbon. So. The good news is, we don't have to start with trees this big because we can change the management of the existing trees and they are at an age, even the trees in Maine, of which there are not nearly enough big trees in Maine, another That's thing right. Bill and I agree on, yes. um, even those trees in Maine are already you know, head high or twice my head high, well, twice my head high isn't that much, but anyway. <laughs> um, so, and they're already at a stage where they're sequestering carbon faster than a little seedling is going right. to. Right. And so changing the management of our existing forests on a global level is probably much more important than planting a trillion trees. Yeah. And saving our forests, preventing the loss of forests to development and to uh, agricultural clearing in the Amazon, but right here in Berkshire County yeah. to residential development, to solar development, that is among the most crucial things we can do. And then you get into how do you manage a reserve when you've got issues with changing climate and growing mortality of older trees on a global scale. There's a lot of complexity to work with here. But there's also potential. There is. In the back. Yes. So being a consulting forester and private forest landowner and having done it since 1976, there are many things I object to. The fact that we're isolating Massachusetts forests for exclusion of forest cutting. When even in the UN report, it says in the long term, sustainable forest management is the key. It keeps us from losing our forest land. So we don't have to reforest it. We don't lose our acres of forest land. And people that are doing it forestry, I am not practicing forestry to grow as fast as I can to release carbon as fast as I can. I am growing forests to manage for the goals and objectives of my clients and for myself. And oftentimes it's habitat related, not either lumber production or firewood production or biomass production. And even in the UN report, 
They say biofuels are important in the long range battle that we have. And we have a big battle with carbon, but we're, none of us that I can see are reducing airplane flights, are reducing miles driven, are changing from SUVs to small cars, yet we're thinking that the answer is going to come from forests in Massachusetts and therefore we're going to ban cutting trees on any state land in Massachusetts when it's clear in here that sustained management is the answer. That getting trees to grow better, as Frank said, is by thinning them out. And what are you going to do with the product you thin out? You can let it rot and release its carbon. You can burn it and release its carbon. You can use it for small timber framing and save some of it. We, the latest thing is, we typically wear clothes for three times and then we throw them out. I'll tell you that, these right. clothes have been I, I go. So, <laughs> so, so I think that Jim is highlighting some really interesting points. Um, one of them is, as a consulting forester, he knows how to grow trees, right? That's true. And yet what we find on a statewide scale is when you poll landowners, you find that the majority of them, the vast majority of them, can't name a, a consulting forester. We did a poll in the, along the Massachusetts-Connecticut border in a fairly rural area near Southbridge, and we found that 80% of the landowners could not name a consulting forester. And yet, 50% of the landowners said they had done a cut. So there's a real need for Jim's set of skills to be applied to a larger set of lands, and that in itself would help us to store more True. store more <coughs> carbon. But by the way, Jim, if you, if you read read the rest of the IPCC report, it points out the high carbon intensity of bioenergy and why it's not a good idea. So just just so you know, his executive summary they included. I, as I the know, best but, but if you read the, what's behind the summary, the summary, as you know, doesn't include everything. So there's. Uh, <clears throat> the other thing I will say that I think is really important is, you know, when I first started uh, living in the Berkshires, uh, I was driving a vehicle that got about 20 miles to the gallon. And today I drove here in a vehicle that's getting 50 miles to the gallon that has all the same capabilities as the vehicle that I drove that got 20 miles to the gallon. So there's technological improvement, there's different ways of doing things, the same thing is going to be true in the forest product sector and in the forest sector. There's ways that we're going to harvest that release less emissions. The Nature Conservancy at a global scale put out a whole issue of a, a scientific journal on reduced impact logging. Unfortunately, it was only about the tropics, but it's still really interesting. Um, that's about how do you cut the emissions that Bill spoke to from the actual logging itself. There's different ways that we can do things. There's different techniques for how we might use small diameter product. There's a new mill opening in Maine that's going to turn some of what might have gone into pulp or bioenergy into wood fiber <coughs> insulation that they use instead of fiberglass in your walls. So there's going to be new products. So I, I personally tend to want us to focus on the positive future and to see those of us who believe in forests and their potential to help with the climate crisis to work together because most people who are thinking about climate aren't thinking about forests at all. So we got a big hump to get across first. Right. And, and, and as I said, it could be 30% of the solution that we need. Uh, and, and, and by the way, I, I, I'm including better management of existing forests for production for us. I'm not, I'm not opposing that. I'm just saying that, that right now, virtually all management of forest, of the forests that are managed is for, is for timber production, with, and in most cases without any consideration, right? Because it's a new idea. This has not been around for very long for the implications for how to manage it for in a climate changing world, both in terms of its resilience and in terms of its ability to remove carbon dioxide. And this is where I think we all need to learn more, but there's a lot out there as well already to know that this is possible and that we can do it if we work together. But if we keep just batting against and saying, oh, we've got to manage everything the way we used to manage it to, to produce lumber, then we're not going to get there. 
We, we just really need to work together to find the best ways of doing this. Absolutely. Your picture here, right? Yes. What would you classify that as? Is that a that's, that's, ideal forest right there? It's a, it's a very young forest, a relatively young forest. Okay. And so it has the potential to grow, um, right. but it, it's it's not storing a Does huge amount. Does it need help? What? Does it need help? I don't know. Ask the forester. <laughs> <laughs> no, to meet your goals, would you leave it alone? Would you enhance it? Well, I don't think this one's going to be very productive because it's growing on rocks. I know, but that's is that, lot, New England is rocks. Doing? Is that right? <laughs> good, good. But, I mean, that's we have a lot of rocks, right? That's right. That's right. So, can you make but, that any better? Well, you could, but remember, uh, even carbon storage is not the only purpose of forests. Mm -hmm. You know, eighty percent of the biological diversity on this planet is in forests, and forests are more productive when they are more biodiverse. We haven't done this fortunately here or in this part of the country, but up in Maine and in the southeast, they've gone to lots of monocultural forest practices. They're not very productive. I mean, the only way they're productive is you ton tons of nitrogen fertilizer on it to keep it going, which then releases nitrous oxide, which is 300 times more potent global warming gas than carbon dioxide per ton. So that's, that's a losing proposition from a climate point of view. That's true in the southeast. Yep. Hardly anybody does yeah. monocultures and fertilizes in Maine, though. Well, they only have they only they have, three, have three species. Yeah, right? it's, not mean, it's not a very diverse forest. It's not a very diverse Sorry, three, three is an exaggeration, but they, they have fewer yeah. species. Yes. Do urban forests fit in in a meaningful way with carbon sequestration? Yeah, growing trees in cities is kind of interesting because uh, they do store some carbon, but more importantly, they cool the. Uh, the heat island effect through evapotranspiration. Every time water evaporates from the leaves, it takes heat away. And they also, by sucking up water and evaporating it, they reduce flooding. And of course, with these more intense downpours we're getting, um, that's important. Uh, and if you look at, look at the cooling, and the shading obviously also helps uh, cool cities. When they had to cut down those, how many, how many trees did they cut down in Worcester for the Asian longhorn beetle. It was it was thousands, tens, tens of, of tens thousands. of three. I heard thirty thousand one time. I don't know, but let's say it it's a big number. Over 000 and trees. some clever person looked at the electric bills of the people in those areas the summer before and the summer after, and they used in, the ones that were really in it used ninety percent more electricity during those summer months, which is a lot of carbon dioxide emissions. So turn that around. Those emissions were being saved by having those trees there. And so, unfortunately, most cities don't take good care of their urban trees. You know, their their biggest job is just cutting them down when they start dropping branches and stuff. And they they, they really need to they, they need help. <laughs> yes. I just want to say that I'm running a U.S. Forest Service grant for the city of North Adams, planting urban trees. And besides all those things you you highlighted there, I think that what I'm what I look at it is, is I'm drawing human beings that plant trees and that know trees and that <laughs> maybe turn into foresters or whatever. But I, human beings are the driver of the problem. So sometimes I think we don't focus on the we focus on the solution and not the problem. And I, I think that when I think about urban tree planting, it's something that people can do, yep. and they can plant a tree and they get to know it, and then they maybe get to know the forest and they get to know the value of the forest and. And it's like, if Trump says he wants to plant a trillion trees, take the money and let's plant a trillion trees. Because I think that out of it, we get more like-minded people that grow up with tree planting and preservation of forests. Absolutely. Let's plant a trillion trees. Let's just not only do that. Yeah. This fellow has been trying to get a question. Yeah. Yes, sure. Um, can you point us, if we're going to do this, to a model of a forest, preferably near here, that is being managed? for carbon sequestration maximization so we can actually understand sure. not what to do, but how, how to, to do, do it. it. Well, although it wasn't set aside for that purpose, um, t 10 years ago, uh, the state uh, had a forest visioning, futures visioning uh, program. I, I was on that commission along with a dozen other people. Three, three or four foresters were on it. There were a whole bunch of people. And one of the things that we recommended was that there be some reserved areas in the, in the state forests. There should be uh, um, 
woodlands where there would be harvesting, uh, there would be reserves, there would be parklands. And each one would have a different priority list of things. So recreation is obviously near the top in parklands, right? That, that's the, 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 the management you do. Uh, but you're not, there's, there'd be no sort of, um, you know, uh, commercial scale cutting of, on those lands or on the reserves. But there would be on the, on the reserves. And so, you know, even if we even if we made them all reserves and parklands, it still wouldn't be it wouldn't change the economic dynamic, and it would be fairer to private landowners if the state weren't undercutting them all the time, literally, with their with their their, their uh, the the, the, uh, uh, the 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 economic way in which the state can do these compared to an individual landowner. But um, Bill finally right said something here. I'm going to disagree with him on, but that'll... But, okay, <laughs> but over, I mean, if you just go over, over to Charlemont, go to, go to Mont Trail Street Forest, there's several stands there that give you an idea of what it would be like if we had a few areas that were allowed to grow, because they've been allowed to grow. There are trees there that are 150, 200 years old. I think it's five of the ten tallest trees in the whole Northeast are in Western Massachusetts. The largest sugar maple in the nature of the... the National Champion Sugar Maple is in our western forest in Franklin County, just over the Berkshire County Franklin line. Uh, so there are places around to go and see what it would be like if they weren't managed on a traditional uh, forest management basis. The other thing I'd recommend is um, on New England Forestry Foundation's website, newenglandforestry.org, um, we have a map of all of our properties around the state, and we have. Uh, the rice preserve in Beckett, we have a, a property in Alford, and we have a variety of properties scattered around western Massachusetts. In general, our properties, even though they are managed for timber production, they have about 54 tons per acre of carbon on of, in living trees on them, which is about 25% higher than yeah. the statewide average. So if you want to see what production forestry that is carbon sensitive looks like, I recommend you go to one of our properties that's been in in Neff's hands for a while. And if you really want a beautiful day, uh, go to uh, our property on uh, Squam Lake in Holderness, New Hampshire. It's a beautiful, beautiful walk. It's a really diverse forest. It's been harvested five times since we came into our ownership in 1953. But you'll rarely find a property with more beautiful old trees on it at the same time. One last question. Sure. I know yes. that you don't have questions, but I just want to kind of answer the question too in, in, in a way. Um, I know that Pleasant Valley and Lennox, the Mass Island yes. property, they're participating in the California corn market. So right. it might be a good example to look at the small properties that it's participating. I think it's about 1,100 acres that they have there. It's, 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 you know, but it's still, it's a, for, for New England, that's a big single ownership. <laughs> right. So if any of you have found this interesting, come back in February. We're going to flip the roles. Bill will join me afterwards for more questions, and um, I'll present a slightly different frame and a slightly different set of recommendations. Although, again, it, I completely agree that it's a climate crisis, that forests are part of the solution, and that part of that solution is storing more carbon in our living forests. I have some more parts to the solution to talk right. about. Too. Good. Okay. Thanks very Good. much. Good. Thank you. Thank you.